This video is an extension of the introductory lectures given in Economics 136 about assumptions we make in certain kinds of financial modeling. This video specifically discusses how to calculate continuous growth rates from financial price data. You might remember in Economics 136, we began with the assumption, at least under certain circumstances, that the log of the stock price follows Brownian motion with drift, and we got this differential equation shown here at the bottom to represent that. That eventually led to the expression on the very bottom of this slide, the log of the ratio of the two prices is equal to the sum of the drift plus the noise, effectively. That raises the question, though, in this model about why we use the log growth rate of the price rather than just say the price. Well, we are interested in calculating return on investment or rates of return on different competing assets, and we want values that can be normalized for comparisons. So for stocks, the growth rate of capital gains will be a good proxy. Here's an example comparing Microsoft to Apple for 2017. When you take a look at these, it's not very clear which of these two companies performed best. But if you instead compare the growth rate of the two stocks, you can see that Apple came out on top, but not by very much. And you can see that earlier in the year, Apple was doing considerably better than Microsoft, but Apple caught up. So when we're comparing two stocks or multiple financial assets, their growth rates allow us to normalize to a common denominator. That raises the question about which growth rate we want to use or which estimator we want to use. Now suppose in this example we're comparing an initial value of 100 to a later value of 115. On the top we have the standard discrete formula for the growth rate which will give us a percentage of 15%. The geometric discrete growth rate simply multiplies the new value by the old value and gives us the discrete growth rate plus 1%. But the one we're going to use will be the continuous log growth rate on the bottom, which is equal to the natural log of the newest observation over the original observation or the difference of those logs, which mathematically ends up being the same, and that will be a smaller number at about 14%. It's smaller because this is effectively continuous compounding of the rate of return. We'll say more about that later when we discuss the math. So the question becomes for us, how do we get a reliable estimate of the growth rate for a stock, like, for example, this exchange traded product shown here. This is a segment of a 252 daily observation cycle for SPY, the tracking stock that tracks the S&P 500. There are typically 252 trading days in the year, give or take a day or two, and this is a segment that shows the 15 trading days at the beginning of the year. So. What do we do if we want to convert this to a daily growth rate? Well, let's take a look at some background math to figure out the answer to that. Let's first of all look at the definition of continuous compounding. So we're saying here, if we're thinking about variables that change over time, like the market value of the stock or the value of the home, we can say the future value of the variable is equal to the original value of the variable times an instantaneous growth rate expressed by this formula, where E represents Euler's number 2.718 indefinitely. So, in application, perhaps we can ask what's the value of a house if it was purchased at $120,000 and has been growing in value at the rate of 8% annually, compounded daily for a period of four years and three months? And the answer is $168,590.
So you might say, you didn't say anything about compounding daily. This is supposed to be a continuous growth rate. Well, it turns out that if you're compounding daily and comparing it to continuous compounding, then the value is the same up to two decimal points. So one's a pretty good proxy for the other. So we can think of continuous compounding as instantaneous compounding or perhaps compounding daily. With discounting, we ask the question, what is the present value of an asset or a contract that will be delivered in the future if we use the continuous compounding interest rate of R? Here we are asking, what is the present value of something where we know its value in the future given an interest rate discount? These are used extensively in the valuation of futures and forward contracts as well as generally in financial valuations. For example, what is the present value of $100,000 to be delivered in four years and six months if the present short-term money rate compounded daily is 3.45%? And the answer is going to be the present value is $85,620 as we fill in these values here. So that introduces the principle of discounting and compounding. But what does that have to do with log growth rates? Let's take a look at the relationship between these variables when we're using logs and remind ourselves that when we're using Euler's number, that if we define x to equal that number to the power of n, then by definition the natural log of x is equal to n. So continuing, if we have the same expression with the constant, then when we take the natural log of that, we get a linear expression, such as the one shown here on the right, which implies that if we rewrite this as a time series equation, where we say xt is equal to the initial value of x times the exponential to the power of r times t, then if we take the natural log of that, we get this linear expression that gives us a constant plus r times t. And therefore, we can conclude that if you take the first partial derivative of the natural log of x, expressed this way, that is equal to our continuous growth rate. So therefore, when we take the first partial derivative of the natural log, the resulting answer, if it's time series data, is going to be our log growth rate. So that's what we want to do. So for data conversion, we therefore assume the following. So we start with this assumption that the future price is equal to the present price compounded. We then take the natural log of that and get this linear expression here. Then we rearrange the equations and get the difference of logs adjusted for time is equal to the growth rate, r, and that can also be written as the log of the ratio adjusted for time is equal to r. So finally, we get back to the answer to our question. How do we estimate measures of daily continuous growth rates for SPY? We've got the formula here at the top now that says if we take the natural log of the prices or we take the difference of the logs, by the log quotient rule, they mean the same thing. We are able to calculate first the logs using this Excel spreadsheet, if that's the approach we want to take, and the differences. And so finally, the column labeled DCGR represents our converted data. Then once we have that data, we can calculate the mean and the standard deviation and the variance from this log converted data using these formulas here. First, obviously, the mean growth rate is simply the average. The variance of the growth rate is the difference of the observation minus the mean squared, adjusted for the sample size. And finally, the standard deviation of the growth rate is the square root of the variance. The reason we're doing this is because we want to have a reliable volatility estimator. And so that begs the question, is this going to be a good proxy for a volatility estimator? And it turns out that these continuous growth rates, when plotted, for example, as a histogram, as is done here, will usually fit, or very nearly fit, a normal distribution. 
which turns out to be very useful to us because we can use the properties of normal distributions and standard normal distributions to evaluate probabilities of being in certain ranges for these assets. This right here is a chart for SPY from I think 2015 plotted against the ideal, the blue standard normal, to give a sense of how well this fits and as you can see the fit is reasonably good. Here we're looking at Netflix for January 16, 2018 using data going back two years and on the upper right we can see the plot of standard deviation that's what we're calling daily volatility and it has a reasonably good fit and on the left we can see that adjusted to normal so for example the value at the bottom that says 2 on the two-year X sigma frequency is the number of two sigma observations that were made out of that sample set. And then on the bottom of this slide we see a pandas data frame that calculates the standard deviation for two-year, one-year, 90-day, and 30-day from the same data set. So we're going to be able to use this to say a great deal about the volatility of these financial assets, at least as a starting proposition. Now in this class, we'll normally be using daily continuous growth rates as a measure of daily estimated volatility because here we're talking about making option trades where you're in and out in days or even hours or minutes. And so the standard textbook definition of annual volatility has almost no relevance to that world. And we're also going to be treating volatility as a variable rather than a constant in this class. And it makes it a little easier to do that when you're talking about short periods of time, like a day compared to a year. So this slide set was maybe a little long-winded and maybe went into a little too much detail, but I want to make sure that you understand exactly why we're using log growth rates instead of other proxies for our volatility estimators in this class. And I guess by now you hopefully understand that.